Okay, so welcome to our first virtual Montessori journey. Um, is everybody able to hear me? You can give a, a thumbs up on your screen if all's good. Awesome, thanks so much for that. Um, I've been at CMS for 12 years now and we've done a Montessori journey uh, every single fall. And it's a wonderful event, and I'm really happy that we're able to, to do it, even though we're having to do it virtually this year. Um, I think that one of our, when you think about Montessori education, one of the, the things that happens in classrooms and one of the main goals with using Montessori materials is that we take these abstract ideas and abstract concepts and we put them in a concrete form for the children to uh, to absorb. And that's kind of what the Montessori journey is attempting to do. We talk about, you know, freedom within limits and fostering independence and all these things that are kind of abstract. And this is a way where you can step into the classroom with the guides and you can kind of see a concrete form of what this educational philosophy really is about. So in my mind, that's kind of what we're doing today. Um, so I want to introduce you to the staff who are participating uh, today before we start the actual journey. Um, I'm, I'm here. I'm myself. I'm, this is my sixth year as the uh, director at CMS. Um, prior to that, I was a, a children's house guide um, here. And 2020 is actually kind of an anniversary year for me since I did my primary training in 1990. Um, this is 30 years of Montessori education for me, which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, I have two teenage children who both are CMS alumni, and so I have the parent uh, hat perspective as well, um, as do many of the people that you're going to meet here in just a second. Um, so uh, I'm going to go in chronological order, not the guide's age, of course, but the age of the children that they work with. <laughs> So uh, we'll start with, we have six of our wonderful guides who are joining us today, and Miss Jeanette uh, is our NEDO guide, and I think she's been, I think Jeanette's been part of um, our NEDO community pretty much since it was started, um, right from the beginning. She's, this is your sixth year, right? Yes. Good. Give a wave, Jeanette. Good morning. Thank you. Um, the children that are in Jeanette's NEDO environment as infants, they will transition into the casita when they grow into the toddler age. And we have um, Carla here uh, this morning as our casita guide. Carla, you want to give a wave? There she Hello. is. Hi. Um, Carla is herself a monastery child, which is pretty cool. She went to a monastery school. Um, from primary, I think, all the way up to eighth grade. Am I right about that? And um, she's had experience at the Casita Children's House level both. And um, she's also got two children who are CMS students. So she's got the parent perspective as well. The students that are in Carla's community, when they become preschoolers, they transition to a children's house classroom. And so we have Miss uh, Cindy Ma here. Cindy, you want to give a wave? There she is. Hello. <laughs> I think Cindy is of the six that are of our six guides who are here this morning. I think Cindy is the longest oh. tenured staff member. I think this is your 17th year at CMS. 17th or 18th. I'm <laughs> glad you didn't go for oldest to youngest because I'll be the <laughs> And Cindy's also a CMS parent. She's got a child in the children's house and uh, also one in elementary. Um, yes. And then the, the children that are um, in Cindy's classroom, the children's house students, are going to transition uh, into lower elementary when they become elementary age people. And we have Veronica here today to talk about the lower elementary. I'm going to give away, say hello, there she is. Hi, Veronica. Um, glad to be here and to see everybody. Uh, this is my 14th year as a Montessori guide. I got into this when my child was starting in Montessori years ago um, and uh, journeyed on from primary. Now I'm an 
Lower Elementary. So, um, so glad to be here with everybody and having this little morning chat about the prepared environment and whatnot. So, thank talk you. To you all in a bit. All right. So the children who are in Veronica's lower elementary environment, um, they transition into an upper elementary environment um, in fourth grade. And those children then go to Gina, who's, there she is. Hi, Gina. Um, Gina's in the guide in the Live Oak community. Um, Gina taught both of my children when they were here at CMS. So I know firsthand what a powerhouse she is um, in the classroom. And I think you've had 14 years at CMS, something like that. Um, and I think she's gotten to, to do the Montessori journey 14 times, if I'm right about that. Because um, we only have one upper elementary guide. We are on the and Gina is also a Montessori parent. She's got two sons who are uh, here at CMS both of them in elementary. And the children in Gina's upper elementary class, they transition to the adolescent community um, mm -hmm. at, at sixth grade, after sixth grade. And um, we have Charlie, who is our guide in the adolescent community. Hey, Charlie. Hello. Charlie has a 15 years of teaching experience, but two years in Montessori, um, he was a a teacher at a magnet school in Austin that uh, yes. had a STEM focus. And yes. mm -hmm. his Nova community is a really uh, interesting, unique blend of Montessori and that STEM background. So it's awesome. I can't wait for you guys to see it. <laughs> it's pretty fun to teach here. I love my job. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, so we're going to keep moving along then. Um, after our silent journey, we're going to gather in the Nido classroom. So when the slideshow ends, we're going to then transition to Ms. Gina. All right, so here we go.
So on to you, Ms. Janette. Good morning. Um, I really just wanted to focus, um, I guess, really on the, the beginning and kind of the end. So the progress of what our program entails um, with our, our children. We have young, young, as young as two months, um, two month old babies and as old as 18 month old children. So there's a big growth um, that happens in our, in our classroom. So some of our children are immobile. And so we've got wide open spaces with a large mirror for them to get some feedback from their gross motor movements as they're rolling over or as they're watching the mobile. Um, this is actually double sided. The younger children use the black and white and as they are able to develop um, their eyes and see more color, it turns over to a colored um, side of the mobile. So right now we have older children, so they're on the colored side. Um, these are also small mobiles that are, it's, it's actually mobile. <laughs> so we can relocate it as needed. Um, and now it's a wide open um, pull-up bar for older children who are wanting to walk. And so it's, that's the beauty of this classroom, that they can have a wide open area to just move and get around. The bridge is pretty large in our classroom, but we have eight students. And so it's nice that it can accommodate more than one child at a time. We, um, we actually have some children that don't have stairs in their home. And so they're still able to practice going up and down safely um, here in our classroom. Another thing for movement that we have is also the weighted wagon. This is very light if it's not weighted down. And so these jugs of water are just an improvisation. Um, and it's very easily without anything in it. I can move it with one hand. Once I weighted it down, I've got to use a lot more effort. And so the children um, can use all of their effort in their body to push, push, push with all of their strength and then they become more confident and comfortable in their own body movements and they actually can control that. Um, the sleeping area is designed to let the children come in and out of their beds on their own. That's what the four beds um, are designed to do. This is different um, as opposed to a crib that is more of like an encased um, area for the child. We try and foster independence as best as we can. And so as the children get older and are able to walk, they transition to a nap mat like this. And they actually come out of the gated area because they're now free to get up and walk to the bathroom and come and choose their work once they're awake after nap. Um, so this will be a child that's more 12 months and up that's actually able to walk and is ready to transition to the toddler class. As they're more independent and sitting up on their own, they come and sit at the table on their own and they have perfectly sized uh, silverware and dishes for them so that they can actually eat independently as well. Um, but backtracking a little bit, the younger ones who are not yet sitting up on their own have a specially designed table for them where the adult does a lot of um, collaboration during meal times, And so they'll sit here and have a one-on-one -on -one experience um, as they're first learning about food and eating. And then they will transition to the communal table to where they have um, other children to kind of give feedback as to how to practice using their forks and their spoons. Um, it becomes more of a communal uh, meal and not just a one-on-one -on -one first experience. That's the eating area. And toiling is very similar to the toddler class because we do our best to prepare them before they transition up so that it's not all so um, sudden and um, I guess overwhelming for a child who has you know, been used to having a, an adult change their diaper for them their whole life. Um, now it's a different experience having them participate in pulling up their underwear, um, sitting down on the toilet on their own um, without being laid down on a changing table. So they actually start here on the table having one-on-one -on -one interactions with adults and then they transition up to these little toilets and this bench. Um, this also helps with their movement and independence because we have children who start off needing the adult to help them lift up off the toilet. And before they're moving out, they're actually standing on their own to move over and sit on the bench. So those um, opportunities for that independent movement is, is really important. Classroom. They ha we have these dividers that help isolate each individual material um, just as the child is not able to do so quite yet. Um, 
everything just seems fun and interesting. So in order to help them focus in on one material, um, these dividers work great. These are actually IKEA shelves. So if you're in the market for designing this at home, that's a really great place to start. Here we go. The basket is accessible for the children. Again, helping to foster that independence. Um, they don't have to rely on the adult to start a story time. Um, they can simply crawl over themselves, pick a book to look at, and then the adult can actually take that hint as, oh, let's read a book together, or you know, just admire them looking at the pictures. So everything is just free choice and safely um, being able to foster that gross motor movement and that independence. Jeanette, you have a, a question in the chat. Uh, when do the children start using utensils? The utensils actually start as early as I see that fine, um, fine motor grasp start to develop. So it can be as early as about eight months. It actually takes a lot more work than we would think um, to be able to use just two fingers to hold things. Um, so it, usually what we see is about six to eight months, the child is still using their entire hand. And then that turns over to three fingers, so two fingers and an opposing thumb. And then that even gets more refined to the one finger, and that's the pincer grasp here. So between eight to 10 months is usually when we see that. These are things that the children have seen before um, at meal times, and now they're on our shelf as um, language materials. And so we've got a small colander. The children love to just use and look at and feel the different texture of um, and a plastic cup. And so I actually see children who will not drink um, water out of a glass at the table yet because they don't have that concept quite yet. Um, they're, they're on the younger end, um, but they'll have this cup on the shelf and I see them drinking out of it like if it has something in it. So just as early as starting that little connection that, wow, this is actually to drink out of. When they are introduced um, at the table, they will have meaningful um, purpose for that. They won't just wow, what is this glass? I've never seen it ever. So let me just bang it on the table while it's filled with water. Um, they won't be inclined to do that anymore because they've had that experience on the shelf. And now that it's actually a meal time, um, they'll know, wait a minute, this has a purpose. Um, it has actual function to it. I feel the biggest part of my job is just observing them and following them and making sure that the work that's on the shelf is catering to those needs that, that they have at that moment in time. So a final question, Jeanette, um, you mentioned that you want the environment to kind of be responsive. Like are you, um, you're kind of frequently going and rotating items that are on the shelf that kind of reflect as the children are growing? Would you say it's that's actually, accurate? It's actually not frequently, um, but it is based on the needs of the child then and there. Um, most times actually, the more the material is changed, the less it's used. Um, the children like that point of reference. They like that consistent work where they come into the classroom and everything looks the same. Um, it feels more like home. And once I see that the, like the material is actually not being touched on the shelf, that's when they get rotated out. Um, that shows that they're not, they're not meeting any needs. Um, no child is inclined to go and grab that work. So. Um, but that's rare. <laughs> yeah. Usually our work is all over the, the classroom, but that's when I know that the children are busy. Um, they're, they're working. So. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, um, so we're now moving to uh, the next level, which is the children leave Jeanette's classroom when they um, are steady walkers. So that could be, you know, a range of ages, 14, 15, 18 months, depending on the child. Um, and then they enter the casita environment. And so we're gonna transition now to uh, Carla, who's gonna talk about her casita classroom. Hi, I'm Carla. I'm one of the casita guides here in the Rosemary class. And like Stephanie said, the children in here are anywhere from like 12, 13, 14 months, um, once they've started walking well, and all the way up to three years. So, the major focuses in our class are movement. You know, they've just started walking. They're really working on their fine motor movements. So we have a lot of materials for the development of movement. And then they've also just started learning a lot of language and learning how to talk. And so we focus a lot on language and we also focus on independence. So if we start like right when they come in the door in the morning, 
we have this area for arrival and departure where every child has their own cubby. And this is just set up so that they can be in, as independent as possible with putting their things away. So then inside their cubby, we keep, we unpack their clothes so that they can have access when they have an accident or their, or their shirt gets wet or their pants get wet and they need to change, which is pretty frequently in here. They can come to their cubby and get a shirt or get some underwear or whatever they need. There's hooks up here where they can learn how to hang up their backpack. Um, there's a spot for their lunch box. They take off their shoes and put them up here. So we help them with it, but we are always kind of thinking about how to give them more and more independence with it. Let's see, let me see. Okay, so here's, we, we have some rings and stackers. So the whole range of these, um, just to develop that hand-eye coordination, this is a really, you know, it's actually tricky for them to figure out how to hold this with their pincer grasp and then line it up with the pole and get it on. So this is a really fun work for those younger ones. Then we add a little bit of difficulty with this one that has a bend in it. So you have to slide that on and move your wrist to get it to go on. And then getting it off is even harder because you're fighting gravity at the same time. They also just really love any sort of activity where you put something in a hole and it disappears. So we have these coin boxes that are really fun for them. That's an added difficulty over this because they have to get their wrist correct in order to get it to go in. And then they can open it up and start over again. We add a little difficulty with this one. Once, they're, once they've mastered that, they get kind of bored with it. So we put out this one. This one they have to, the hole is smaller. So they have to push, push, push to get it through. Then moving along when, the, when they get, as they get older and more refined with their fine motor skills, they love the little lock box. They can try putting the key in turn it, open up the box, and they find a little surprise inside. And we change that sometimes so that, you know, to keep the interest, they can come here and open it and see what we've put in there today. And then as they're getting older, they can even learn how to use a pair of scissors. We just have a really simple cutting work so they can cut a strip of paper. So when you guys see little envelopes of paper cuttings coming home, that's, that's because they've been using the scissors. And then finally, the oldest children in the class even learn how to sew. So we have a, a paper sewing card with some holes in it. We have a needle and thread and they can learn how to go up and down. So we really have a big range of fine motor um, activities in here. Another one of the focuses in our class is language. So they're, they're absorbing vocabulary at a huge rate at this age. So we're actually, the adults in the class are actually the most important language work in here because we just talk to them constantly. We describe everything we're doing. We give them language for all their clothes and everything we're doing you know, every work that we're playing with and stuff. But we also have specific language works that we teach vocabulary with. So we start with real objects. This is an example. We have bath items here. So we have a little shampoo. We have a washcloth, a rubber duck, a soap dish, and some soap. And they love just exploring with this. And then we have a little game that we play where you know, I ask them, hand me the rubber duck, and they hand it to me, and just, just to develop their, their vocabulary. And then we also have models, um, model objects, like this furniture, so we have a rocking chair, an armchair, um, and things to teach really any kind of vocabulary. We move on to naming objects, and we have matching cards. So now they're seeing that these pictures actually 
are a representation of a real object. So they learn that this is a scooter and then they can see that this is exactly the same. The scooter, skateboard, motorcycle. So they're beginning to see that the, you know, pictures and books and stuff are representations of actual real items. Uh, we also, of course, do a lot of reading books. That's a great language development tool. And then in, and we sing a lot of songs too. So toileting, toilet learning is a big part of um, our classroom. They're going from 12 months to three years, so they're going to become potty trained in this time. You can see it's kind of similar to the Neato. We have little potties for them. We have little wipes so they can practice wiping themselves. When they get, as they get older, they like to transition, you know, like a bigger kid, and transition to using the toilet. And then we have child size sinks with a, a little stool here so that they can wash their hands on their own. They love this a lot, especially when they're new, they'll spend a lot of time just washing their hands over and over again. We even have a little tiny um, soap dispenser that they can learn how to use on their own and little drying cloths so they can dry their hands and a laundry basket. So everything they need is set up right there so they can go and wash their hands on their own. So children of this age really love to um, imitate what they see adults doing and they actually really love chores. What we consider to be chores and we really don't like to do, they love to do. So we have like an, a mop for instance. When there's a spill on the floor, I grab my mop and clean it up. And as soon as I grab this mop, I can almost guarantee you one of the children is gonna run over <laughs> to this mop and grab it and join in because they just love, they love participating in everyday life. And um, we have a question, Carla, what is lunchtime like for these children? Um, you know, we try to show them how to open their containers themselves, unpack their lunchbox, and then once, they're all, once they've all washed their hands and sat down and are ready to eat, then we sing a song and then we all eat together. And then when they're finished, we help them clean up. You know, again, we try to give them as much independence as possible. They pack everything back up into their lunch boxes, zip it up, bring it over to their cubby and then head over for a nap. Exactly, like everything we do in here is whether it's on the shelf as a work activity or if it's just learning how to pull down your own underwear. That takes a, a long time for them to figure out how to, it's actually really difficult to, for them to push, grab their underwear and push it down. So every step of the way, we're trying to give them just a little bit more independence. We help just as, we give them as little help as needed um, so that they can just incrementally move um, closer and closer to being able to do it on their own. And they, yeah, like you said, that goes for everything in the class. Like, you know, if they just want to practice changing their shirt, that's a fine activity for them to do. It's, in, in Montessori, we like to talk about freedom within limits. Uh, other people, they can think of, you know, toddlers and their um, forceful, exclamations of their uh, viewpoint <laughs> in terms of um, sometimes they tantrum uh, and you know how do you um, approach that in the in the classroom and, and how is it that the environment um, minimizes those situations from even starting in the first place well I think the way we have everything set up for independence and for them to make their own choices, you know, in, just in the first place, they don't have to, we don't force them to do like group activities or anything. Like they are allowed the freedom to move in the classroom and choose which work that they're attracted to in that moment. So, you know, they don't, with giving them that much choice, they're able to find their and meet their own needs in the first place. So it just kind of prevents the tantrums and stuff in the first, it, 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 to begin with. 
Uh, final question for you, Carla, before we transition ourselves to Children's House is about transitioning from Casita to Children's House. What kind of milestones or what kind of, um, you know, rel readiness signs are you looking for when you're thinking about a student who's ready for that transition? So they get ready to transition to Children's House anywhere from two, age two and a half to three. And it's really based on the individual child and kind of their, their level of consciousness. We call the zero to three age range unconscious and, and three to six conscious. So they just become a, like more conscious and aware of what's going on with other people as opposed to just kind of being very focused on themselves and their own needs. And they become more social and want to play with each other a little bit more. Their, their language is really exploding where they're, they're saying more sentences or at least multiple word phrases. They've become either potty trained or very, very close to being potty trained. And they're just, their independence is a lot higher than when they've come in. They can pretty much get dressed by themselves. They can pretty much, you know, use the toilet, wash their hands, eat, and all these things on their own. And, and they start just kind of getting bored with the activities in here and, they, and you can just kind of see that they're ready for, they're intellectually become ready for more challenging work that they're gonna see in the children's house. Um, transition ourselves now to the children's house and we will be going to the Blue Bonnet community and checking in with Cindy. Ms. Hey, good morning. Yes, there she is. Hi, good morning. Welcome to Blue Bonnet Children's House and this environment serving children from three to six years old. There are four key areas in this environment. Their practical life, sensorial, mathematics, and language. Come with me to practical life. <laughs> So when the young child enters in the environment, particle life area is the first area we'll be introducing to. Here we have preliminary exercise to show the child how to do pouring, how to do spooning, how to opening and closing, and how to fold cloth. Not just master the skills, they also build up their concentrations and their eye-hand coordinations. Here you can see this material is also real life materials. They feel familiar to be in this area because they can see a lot of material that related to their home environment as well. And they also learn how to ask for help, how to offer help. Now this time of the year, a lot of younger children, oh, many children come in with a little jacket. A younger child may them now know how to zip or button her own jackets. She will need to go to an older child and ask them politely. Could you please help me zip my jacket? An older child will answer gracefully, yes, I would love to help you zip your jacket. Come with me. So this is not just zipping up a jacket. The older child also feels the confidence in them. They're able to be a valuable member to help other persons in this community. They feel proud of himself and also inspire a little child that Soon, maybe in three or four years after, she got to be just like him, be able to help another member in this community. So this is the beauty of the mixed age group in Montessori classroom. The older one helps the younger children and younger one look up for the older children. Now, let's move to the sensorial area. Here, we also have the control of air function. So children can do self-correcting like the cylinder block. They touch and feel, and they set it down. They can correct themselves because the cylinder would not go into the socket because it does not match. And they correct themselves by touch and feel and see. And that encourages more repetition because a lot of time when they're young, their hearts are fragile. But being told, no, this is not correct, would discourage them where this control of error, they will help themselves to correct themselves. And here we have the geometry of uh, captain offering them the shapes. 
again, they have a brain sensory exploration. They can really hold on to a triangle and they can feel the side of the triangle, the ellipse. It all helps them when they move to map area for geometry. And in sensorial area, it's also another fun word is the geography. So they got to learn the continent. They learn the, later on we have different sets to show them the country in different continents as well. Um, let's move to the map area. Oh, there's one more thing. So a lot of time in sensorial area, we have the sensorial exploration. Here, like a binomial cube, they just touch and feel like a sensory three-dimensional puzzles. But once they move to elementary, it's more like algebra material for them. So we lay a lot of good foundation for mathematical mind. Let's go to the math area. So here, children, they learn how the number of symbols looks like. And they can use the number rods to really touch and count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. They can really touch and count and feel, wow, ten is just not a number ten. The value is so long and big, and they will find the corresponding symbol and match with it. And same thing, they can see the numbers difference have different size and length as well. Once they're familiar with counting one to 10 with the symbols and quantities, when troops use them the decimal system with the golden beads, this is one unit. And they really touch and feel that's one little glass bead. This is one 10. They're really 10 beads on this bar. This is 100. They can see there's 10 tens. 10 10 makes 100. This is 1,000, very heavy and big. They can feel it and touch it as well. There are 10 hundred equals 1,000 numbers. For example, this exercise is bringing 500. So 500 is not just 500. Children can really touch and feel. I got 500, 100, 200, 300. 400s, 500s, and later we have the same material we can manipulate with the math operation with the Beijing. Children do addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. So now we are taking a little concrete material away. Now we have the stamp game. With all the beads they can count, can touch, can feel, we transfer to into wooden tiles but with the corresponding color coded. Unit 10, 100, 1000. And this time they can write down their equations and manipulate it on the table by themselves. And same thing, we also introduce them the fraction at this young age. But it's not so abstract. A lot of times they say, wow, this city why has so many pizza pieces here. They do like pizza somehow. So they got to see this circle got divided into five pieces. One, two, three, four, five. And we told them each piece had their own family name and this family is called the fifth. Each piece is one fifth. One fifth, one fifth, one fifth, one fifth. Now let's move to the language. So when a young child first enters into this class, we do a lot of sound game. We have them sit down as a small group lesson. We're naming those things. And we introduce the beginning sound first, like mm for mug, d for dolphin, t for turtle, for plant, rock, k crystal. We do a lot of exercise. We introduce the ending sound, and eventually we introduce the middle sound. Once they are so familiar with those sounds, then we introduce them the same paper letters. Here, we often choose three. They are looking not so familiar to each other. We only teach them phonetic sound, not the alphabetical names. So here, we name, we do three peer lessons. 
Tic. We show them how to trace naming the letter A. Ah. Mm. Nice then. We introduce them to movable alphabet. Where this is our first writing tool in month in primary classrooms. So here usually we'll assist them at the first few times. And you'll find me cat. The child will go to the box, fetch the sound. Usually I do have to tell them, please give me k at cat. The child say, yes, I hear k in cat. You then fetch a k. Then can you hear k at cat? The child say, yes, I hear at in cat. Then we'll say k at. Oh, yeah, I hear that. Then he forms. Through many days, many weeks, many months of practicing, the child may look around the classroom and say, oh, I see a fan. And he might proceed to spelling a fan by himself. This is the phonetic box. We have different objects. We recite them because they have to be phonetic um, spelling. For example, the dog. It's a dog. And you'll find the label of the dog. And many times the child will say, this is the dog. The dog. So yes, I did blend together. It's another layer of effort. It may take weeks, it may take months for the child able to say, oh, yeah, this is a dog. Dog. And then a Montessori teacher designed this for the Montessori class. This is a book, all phonetically spelling. And the child can do the pick is in a pen. And they can practice on their own because it's all connected. So, and at the end, they may go home and say, Mom, Dad, I know how to read a book. They feel so proud of themselves being able to do it by him or herself. So that's the goal here in Children's House. We want them to be able to say, let me do it by myself. I want to show you more stuff, but I think the time's limit. So I'm going to stop right here, and please do ask me some questions. If um, do you want to talk a little bit about um, what you see typically when a child is ready for that transition? Which you can see some personality changes. Where um, Casita and Children's House we consider as a first plan. That we're still... Um, we can see how we set up the work of their individual eyes because at this point they still like to enjoy learning by themselves. And where when they're ready to go to elementary, they the first thing is they always want to do collaboration work. They always want to call a friend, and say, "Hey, let's sit down, let's make a report together." They wanted to do some challenging work, and they want to share to other friends, not just themselves. That's a, one of the major um, personality changes, and also. At home, as a parent, because I do have one at home now, is they start um, caring about the fairness. It's not fair you say so and so don't have to do it, and I got to do it. Where in children's house, the first plan is basically whatever you tell them, they receive. They have to absorb in mind. They just take it in. <laughs> and of course, they wanted to know more of, for example, when I offer them the geography maps, they want to know more about what, where's the capital of each state. They want to know deeper knowledge of each things. Then that's another sign as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Miss Cindy. We are going to try to stick to our schedule, and so we are going to move on to elementary, but we will come back with you at the reflection time. So now we are going to transition to uh, the Juniper community with Miss Veronica. And Buenos Lee. dias. There she is. I hope y'all can hear me. Yes. Um, so I made some little cue cards because I have to keep myself organized. Otherwise, I'm just going to be all over the place on my fourth cup of coffee. Anyhow, <laughs> our first moment here in Juniper community. Um, one of the points I wanted to bring up, as you'll probably see through the materials, is a sense of order. And that sense of order in the physical environment here in the lower elementary and um, order is intrinsic in the universe. And human beings receive impressions from the universe through these senses. Then we sort, 
we organize and categorize that information as you might have seen through casita primary and now here in lower elementary so we're kind of seeing how that um, sense of order and classification now um, is taking the information and categorizing it a little differently now now we're looking at the hows and the whys from the information that was previously gained in primary um, and one of the most important aspects of order is the process in which humans take in new information and associate it with familiar information which is what happens with that progression from children's house all the way up to adolescent community. So um, I have some here some material and focusing first on the map and we have here our hierarchical material and um, so the hierarchical material is like a powerhouse material I like to call it because it's that gateway lesson that takes them into previous collected knowledge from, from children's house um, it's a transitional material because it builds a foundation for future lessons. This is more my opening lesson for children just entering in first year lower elementary or perhaps a child that's entering without previous children um, house, child house experience. Here we have the quantity and symbol starting with the smallest unit, which is that itty bitty and progressing from the units to the tens to the hundreds thousands and this being introduced as the simple family and we move on to the tens um, of the thousands family the units of the thousands family tens of the thousands family hundreds of the thousands family and now we introduce the million cube which when the children try to lift up this million cube, it takes a collective effort, which really um, brings in that sense of communal work. Everybody is coming together, supporting each other, lifting this material, and it gets that gregarious instinct and that need for large motor movement. And so when this is put away, the children are able to take the material and recreate it. Oftentimes you'll see them collecting cardboard. They want to recreate the million cube. And how can we do that using the materials we find in our environment? Um, so one of the other materials that I've brought up is least common multiples. And least common multiples, again, using that hierarchical color system, we take a look at least common multiples ranging from one to two or even three digit um, numbers. And so the children actually begin to work out the quantities before we were manipulating it with a larger material. And now we're starting to take that progression towards the abstract. We're taking those abstract concepts and putting it in a concrete way for the children to be able to work out collaboratively. And with the checkerboard you see here, for instance, problems such as 3,548 taken 42 times. And now, versus we had such larger material, our material is becoming more condensed as we're looking at the exchange. It, it provides sensorial impressions and manipulative activities for exploration of long multiplication. Um, it provides an impression for the layout for the multiplication algorithm. Um, and that continues also as the lessons progress. And they eventually make that passage to abstraction to be able to do the problem without even touching the material, oftentimes leading them to the large B frame. Um, and so what the checkerboard helps also is instilling that sense of the distributive law and those laws of multiplication, associative law, distributive law. And one of the amazing things to see or to witness are when the children are able to draw those connections um, and have that aha moment in the middle of a lesson. And it, that actually happened this week, so it was phenomenal. Uh, we're moving on to language. And we have here also one of the things about elementary is that many of these concepts are introduced through stories. Um, cosmic education brings that storytelling aspect to the elementary community and environment. And so here we have, for instance, the language family. 
and we can discuss how the baby represents the article and the article is always close to its mother which is represented by the noun a black symbol of a triangle and that is a representation that is very familiar to children coming in from a primary community as well um, close to that but not so close is the adjective and so we see that represented here on the table with our sentence the flat surface and we have our grammar box symbols the children have charts to be able to associate back and refer to that and so the children are able to progress not just through this box but through filler boxes so it's a work that continues some of the other materials that we have is the movable alphabet which is also materials that they use in children's house and they are familiar with and now we're looking at those um, functions of language utilizing movable alphabets and slowly also they move away from the movable alphabets and start to work with materials um, not so much in the concrete aspect but more of an abstraction of the material moving along our history area we have lots of functional geography on the opposite side and so here we take a look at um, the just different types of countries. We're looking at uh, maps from around the world. Um, for instance, our lesson on um, the equinoxes. And because Earth is on a tilted sphere, a tilted axis, my apologies, we are always in a constant rotation. And with that tilt of the axis, and the rotation and revolution of Earth, we're able to see how the children now have a more um, uh, of a visual of how those equinoxes and solstices occur in the elementary community. And so what happens here, for instance, is if we have this light that represents the sun, and here we have Earth. And we draw the child's attention to where we're located, which is here in Texas. And because Earth is on a tilted axis, we show them how that revolution around the sun rotation brings us to different points of day and night, and also how that creates those winter solstices and equinoxes throughout the year. So that up here on the, on the shelf, we have geography command cards you might see here. Um, say for instance, states of matter, and it has the procedures, observations, and we have those running conversations about what are some of the observations that we made. And we look at that from a scientific perspective, and we talk about also what worked and what didn't work. What could we do with that next time? taking that information and applying it in a real life applicable sense. So the handwork area is a big part of our lower elementary. It's part of our everyday life in our community. So we have things, say for instance, embroidery. Some of the children take lessons from biology or from also from geometry and they bring those and start doing handworking as part of their follow-up work. So I'm always amazed to see such materials such as types of lines and types of angles that are being embroidered here. So the children are able to use that large sense of imagination and second plane characteristics. Okay, thank you, Veronica. That was a great tour. Um, you touched on a couple of the things that people usually want to ask about um, in lower elementary, which is how lessons actually kind of transpire and the, the group work aspect. Um, and then they also hear a lot about cosmic education and what does that entail exactly. And so your examples were really great at kind of showing how um, the interconnectedness of the world and things relating. So history is not just something that happened in the past, it's also being created in the present and that's a really great example that you had there. Um, if you want to elaborate just briefly a little bit more on the cosmic education. And so yes, cosmic education um, is a way of interacting with the child, a way that produces the outcomes um, of a philosophical child, an insightful child, a child with an organized mind who understands and loves and is grateful for the universe and their place in it. I think 
the biggest takeaway from cosmic education is what is my role and not just in my immediate environment but the outdoor environment that could be our community that could be um some way half place perhaps halfway around the world and what is my role as a um as that cosmic agent we we want to introduce to the child that they have a huge cosmic task just like many of the um, elements that we study about in the community and that's something that carries on with them to upper elementary and through adolescence and for the rest of their life i think we're really um, taking a look at how it's a large enough curriculum cosmic education for the potential of each child and what is that potential um, and sometimes we don't know that answer. And as the lessons progress, as they move on and take that journey through um, all the way up through adolescence, that is something that is constantly evolving and changing, much like the things around us in our environment. Um, with our understanding of human development, what should we give these second plane children um, as their material for their continued self-construction? And um, I think the biggest takeaway is we give them the universe. And that's something that's given in the cosmic education. Mode. Um, and it is ultimately the work of the child, not the work of the guide. Um, I think sometimes we might think, oh, it's you know the guide and the lessons that they get. But really, it's what does the child do with that seed that's planted through those great stories, through the handwork, through that connection from what we're getting through the cosmic stories and the lessons in the Montessori environment and taking it and applying it outside of these doors and these walls. I think Thank you very much, Ms. Veronica. We're going to move on across the hall there to Upper Elementary to Ms. Gina. Hello. Um, well, I welcome to the Upper Elementary, which is called Live Oak. And um, I know that we kind of err on the side sometimes of using all of our Montessori jargon. Um, and we talked a lot about the prepared environment today. And so just to elaborate that, I'll walk around a little bit. But to elaborate on the um, prepared environment is that we put a lot of thought into what is made available to the children. And so um, that kind of segues. I get a lot of questions from parents about, you know, um, iPad usage and online, uh, online resources. I would definitely recommend that you show your child how to exhaust the resources. So what we do in the classroom is often a child immediately is like, oh, I'm interested in bears. Can I have the iPad? I want to Google it. And so that's what we don't want to do because it is the journey, not the destination. It is that meandering, flipping through the encyclopedias and all the things that they find along the way. And it's also fascinating if you come into an elementary classroom, you often see children, like three or four children hovered around the book. And it's very, very sweet. But it's that kind of meandering exploration because the skill that we want the children to get is how to think and how to seek out answers. We want them to be seekers more than anything else. So they might come to you with questions too, and I would really caution parents not to immediately give them the answer. If they say, why is the sky blue? You can't, you know, blah, 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 give your answer. Instead, a question to ask them is like, where should we look to find that information? And that's one way we, we can model to them on how to find and how to explore. Because that's a big part of what this elementary environment is. It's teaching them how to explore. Children in elementary ask more questions, um, more of the like how and why type questions versus what is that? And so we're giving them the tools in this prepared environment to find the answers that they are looking for. Um, so uh, in talking about this environment specifically, I thought I would show some of the ways we organize and are working to help the children develop executive functioning. So the upper elementary child has had all that time in lower elementary. And so now we get to the point where we're helping them to take everything they've gotten up to this point in primary and lower elementary and especially in math, for example, we're working towards, uh, you know, the Montessori terminology is working towards abstraction, but you're wanting them to learn how to do these operations without needing to have the rectitude, the checkerboard, and all of these hands-on manipulatives. At my level, one of the neat things to do then is to make them, a lot of times they'll learn how to do it on paper, but then when they're older, maybe fifth, sixth grade, make them then show me how to do it on the materials again. Often they'll forget how to use the materials, but it's that higher level of understanding is to be able to explain it and to teach it and have them, after they've abstracted it, go back and try to recreate it. It's really fascinating, especially with the fractions. They'll be able to add and subtract fractions of different denominators because they know they multiply the denominators. 
But um, then when you get off the materials and say, well, show me. <laughs> and a lot of times they really struggle with that. And that's because um, with math three, I feel like that's the upper elementary level. It's, um, I have an Einstein quote. I can come show you over here since I guess I'm supposed to be showing you the classroom. But um, this is what I say to the children over and over and over again. If you can't explain it to a six-year-old, um, you don't understand for yourself. And I probably say that 16 times a day to the children because the ability to explain it is showing an understanding. And often you'll ask a child, what does a certain word mean? And they're like, well, I know what it is when I see it. That's not the level of mastery that we're going for. So helping the children to really start recognizing um, what they know and what they don't know. Because we have this expectation for children to practice and do the follow-up work, but they have to understand since they're not getting a grade, it's more for the internal part of um, what level should they really be understanding that? What is mastery? How do I fully understand and explain it? That's also utilizing the Montessori kind of whole system of having the three-year ages together because often you really do depend on older children to work with the younger ones in the classroom, but really it's solidifying the, the understanding of older children. It's benefiting both um, quite significantly. So I'll show you with um, helping the upper elementary children with um, the executive functioning skills, and that's talking about how to manage your time, how to plan and break things down into steps, and how to estimate time, how long something will take. Elementary children are often not very strong at that. So there's some different tools that I show them in this um, in live oak, um, and I show them all sorts of different ways to do it, and then the idea is that they find what works for them. Um, a lot of times in lower elementary, they have a work journal, and they'll, that's the little notebook, and they'll write down everything that they do throughout the day, and then you're working towards um, having them write down the time so that they can start becoming more aware of time and things like that. I feel like in upper elementary, it's more of what tools are going to last the room through high school and adulthood, and I know for me personally, I'm a big fan of the to-do list. Um, so that's one of the things where we, when you have a lesson, and I can show you in this child's um, in this child binder, we do a lesson log. So they write down all the lessons they have, and then there's a spot where they have to identify whether or not they have followed up on it and practiced it. And that's where I circle back to the, when you practice it, does that mean that you can explain it, you can teach it, you know it well enough to explain it to a six-year-old. So we have the to-do list. Some children really enjoy um, using an agenda where you start, and I don't have the map out their whole week because I don't think any child's ready to start planning that far ahead, but in the morning, when you come in, what do you want to do this morning? And um, so, uh, you know, we color-coded it. But helping them to just kind of map out, okay, well, I should do this first, and then I can take a break and have a snack, and working on those skills. And that's a lot. That's a lot for this age group. So I teach 9 to 12-year-olds, but the skills that they're working on, how do you know what they know? And so we do a lot of um, conferences. I actually have the children do a self-conference with themselves first, where they go through their work, and I have um, some questions that they ask themselves. And they often need some more support to start having that introspection and reflection of like, is this my best? Is this um, an area that I'm strong at or is this an area I need to give more attention to? Then I usually meet with the children pretty regularly and that's where we'll go through their work and we'll talk about what they're interested in and want to do. And um, then, um, then ultimately we do have conferences with the parents um, and where then the children will bring home their work and, um, you know, I know that they're at a level of understanding if they can then show you um, their work and explain it. But a lot of um, the work that children do in this classroom is reports and investigations because they're just so curious at this age group and they're always, um, always asking these questions and then they get to make really cool models because we always want to use our hands on it. And um, just an example from this week is a child was interested in terrariums and if that just led on days and days of research from books, why terrariums work? What, why do you need the charcoal in a terrarium? Why does it get a bad smell if you don't? And we work through all of those things um, to ultimately be able to make a terrarium. But um, with elementary children, you often have to just slow them down. They have these whims and they want that immediate gratification. I think that might be also a side effect of what's been going on in the world right now is that we're just um, not... Um, working towards slowing down and seeking versus that instant gratification because this child definitely wanted to like come in that day and be like i'm going to make a terrarium today but we're working to slow them down and what all we can get out of it as a guide my job is whatever they come in interested in 
it's my job as a guide to figure out how to tie that into the things that they need to learn at this age, um, which is one of the fun things about being being a guide versus a teacher. And the children come in with these bizarre things, and I have become an expert on such obscure animals, um, but always you can tie that back into whatever it is that um, this age group does need to be explore, uh, exposed to, whether it's you know, classification of animals and um, even our garden outside, we have categorized um, our garden by um, whether they're monocotyledons or dicotyledons this year. And um, just taking it all, showing them what they don't know as well, based on what they're interested in. So that's um, kind of my little quick spiel, because I know you guys have been listening for a long time to Montessori teachers. And we're bad about um, talking a lot. Um, we sometimes don't know when to stop. I think we're just passionate and excited about Montessori yeah. education, right, Gina? Um, yes. We have a question uh, for you about staying organized at home. And it is something, I mean, you know, we've put all these systems in place, like here's a labeled basket. As a Montessori guide, you know, I, all the things I tried at home, and it's hard, but they just, they need a lot of support to stay organized because part of it is developmental in their brain because there's just so much happening um, between the ages of 6 and 12, and they just, um, they just don't have that, um, what what we learn in our monastery training is that they're um, putting order in their brain and their knowledge and understanding and so their external environment is not as orderly because all of that energy and effort is put towards the internal order so we can hope that's true um anything else that's like kind of you know hands-on like that or practical that you can think of for tips for home sure um, I get more often than not parents, especially at conferences, what can we do at home to help our child or to support our child, um, give them chores. And it is not so much for, I mean, it's nice that you have the help um, too, but one, it's, that the, it's giving them that sense that the world is not out there to serve them. But there is executive functioning that is developed in when you unload the dishwasher, there is an order that you have to do it in, otherwise dirty dishwater falls in. But um, doing, giving them chores and having the expectation that they, that they do it. Um, and, you know, you may have to do some incentives a little bit, but um, we, I'm always a little bit, and my colleagues and I are always a little bit surprised at how many children don't have chores at home. And that's one that it's just, um, they need to have chores. There are resources where you can look at um, appropriate chores for certain age groups. And maybe that's something we can put in a Tuesday email, Stephanie. Because there'll, there'll be these charts that show this is what a five-year-old can do. This is what an eight-year-old can do. Absolutely. Um, so I think that's a really important thing. And um, for the elementary children, they have this strong sense of justice and fairness. And, um, you know, you'll hear a lot of that's not fair. And a great way to support that because it is kind of a window in their development and it's a window that's not always open is to do community service um, as a family. It's a really nice thing to try to incorporate into your home life or just you know some sort of service for others that's not um that i'm doing this so i get paid i'm doing this because um of this but that gives them a sense of where their place is in the community as a whole in the world as a whole handle this um, a lot of times when we do things unnecessarily for children um they get that it's called learned helplessness and those are the children who come to me like can you open this orange for me? Can you, you know, you should, we see it at lunch a lot where even a nine, 10 year old is asking for help for things that they can do themselves where you're like, well, have you tried a pair of scissors to open that bag, um, you know, bag of chips? And it's because they're used to having people do things for them, but they start to internalize that it's because people don't think I'm capable of it. And so, you know, in fostering your child, everybody wants their child to be confident. That is the way you can do that. And that some parents are unconsciously kind of um, doing the opposite of what they're speaking out to do. That's a great point, Gina. Thank you very much. We're going to move on to Nova so we can wrap up. Um, we're yeah. going a little long, but I think we'll be <laughs> checking in with you for reflection in a couple minutes. Are we good? Hello. How are you guys doing? Welcome to Nova Community. I'm Mr. Charlie, I'm the guy with Randy. She's part of the program as well. Um, so I want to start off like there is no way I can do all of what we do here in like five, ten minutes, no way. So if you ever want to just come and visit or virtually zoom in, I, I will gladly do that because I love what I do. I have a lot of fun in my classroom. And um, I love the fact that in Montessori we get to teach the whole kid, not just academics, but the whole child in its entirety. And um, like in the bio, uh, um, and <coughs> 
like in my album, it's going to show like, this is really what Maria Montessori wanted us to do is really just talk about the child as itself. I mean, as a complete circle as a self-expression about the pre preparation for adulthood and their intelligence, all of these are just as equal. And so what we do here in the adolescence is a lot of social building, a lot of getting the kids to bond well, um, matching what a lot of the, uh, at the uh, children's house and lower levels. So let's get to it because there's so much to do. Um, welcome to my room. It's a maker space. It's a creation space because the highest form of uh, taxonomy is creativity. And so in this room, we create a lot every day. Um, my 3D printers and my uh, laser cutter, laser cutters running, and I'll go show you that in just a bit. Um, but what we have here is a really big room. Uh, we start with the belief of braving, and this is a sign that our students made this year. Um, our braving sign. This is how we build trust in this classroom because it's really important for me for them to have that vocabulary on building trust. So Dr. Brene Brown came up with this way of defining what trust is. And so in this classroom, we, when, whenever our boundary is broken, we talk about that boundary being broken. We talk about what integrity is. We talk about what respect is. So from that, the vocabulary comes right into the classroom, how to build this trust within this community and how I can trust them and how to build that trust. So that's the very first thing we do. And then we go into our week uh, we start at the farm, believe it or not, and I have some pictures here of the farm. We start off with uh, visiting Petunia, which is a little pig here, uh, every morning, and start off a great week with this great attitude at the farm. And um, I encourage you, and there's the goats with Rebecca, and we just love, there's a llama there too, so it's amazing to see and visit. Um, so we have a lot of fun starting off our week, um, starting at the farm. And it builds, uh, it builds a sense of community. It builds work ethic. Um, the kids love being out there with the animals. It shows that real full cycle of life as well. I've seen that more than I care to, to be honest. Um, but it's really important for them to have that empathy building of caring for an animal. And so in our community, having that adolescent starting to care for something other than themselves, which I know is a thing, um, we, this is where that foundation is built in the farm. And um, while I'm here, I might as well show you some of the 3D printing stuff that we do in this classroom as well. Um, because in this room, we make, we build, we create. And that's a big thing in philosophy. So we, we have students design, this is why another thing, we're gonna do soap making at the farm. So not only have they rendered in 3D and actually made it onto Tinkercad, but now it's come to life in a 3D product that we can actually sell or give away uh, for Simple Sparrow Farms. So we have soap mold that we're gonna make and we're gonna make soap on Monday. Uh, when I was a kid, I used to have cardboard cutouts and tape and that, but we can actually make real functional products in our classroom, which is phenomenal. We're bringing out the kids to really make sure that they're, they're just, their imagination comes to life. That's the big part for me, is how can I make it so that their work is really validated and so I really spend some time on that validation and making things like making gears, simple for their projects you'll see. So in this world, we try to bring in a lot of the um, hands-on materials that you saw in the lower levels, but now we're trying to bring it out to be a little bit more abstract. We've done a full circle on these. These are beads that my students have made. They physically made these beads last week because what we're gonna do is part of our microeconomy is actually sell these eventually if we need to, so we can create a market for it. We do a lot of um, seminars in our classroom where we talk as a group, and we actually use this. Here's a material that you might be familiar with, a checkerboard. But we actually have changed how to use the checkerboard to actually multiply binomials and, and, uh, and <coughs> polynomials, sorry. So we can actually do polynomial work on this, and they actually even change it to like a different base unit as well. So the math component of this still has the hands-on aspect, still has manipulatives, but we also like to write it down on paper so they get the abstract thought that they need to do. Actually, every week or so, if the weather's really nice, we actually like to leave this community and go somewhere else. We've been going to um, <clears throat> St. Gabriel's Park, 
we went to an orchard not too long ago. Um, so we could actually leave this community and do learning not just in this room, but outside this room as well. Last year, we spent a week at Fort Davis in East Texas. I really, really need that time where we just bond really strongly together for another week. So every spring and fall, I'm trying to, I will figure out how to get a trip. Um, we have our literature circles. These are two split circles going in my classroom right now. We have one that just finished together and one is just about to finish Malala. So we try to introduce different cultures, different societies. That was the point of this one. And we get to have a lot of introspections on different types of international cultures that we want to just focus on, not just our own. But I'll show you some examples of what students did last uh, yesterday. So what we have here is, this is controlling the energy system of a, um, of a falling object. So it's really, really interesting to see how long. This took them six weeks of design. You think this would have been simple, but it's not. It's actually really complicated. You can even see some of the design work on this one. You see the 3D printing and the mouse and the mouse and the counterbalancing. Um, Caitlin made uh, what's called the flying double escapement and pendulum. And so this one works by wrapping itself. And we introduced Newton's laws on this one. So using the whole entire room, um, she made a really intricate escapement system that controls the amount of energy the system and we talked about the tools of energy we found out that how inefficient electric motors are compared to the falling object ones so we had a great time with this project on wednesdays we get to do a little bit more of uh, the creative aspect um, photography for example is one thing that we've been emphasizing you can see it. so this is a, a picture of like just a simple set of headphones and then we actually were able to change how that product is and then apply it to a website that we're going to create and sell our products on. So all said and done, we teach a lot more than just academics in this classroom. We teach how they can build themselves. And I feel like this place is always humming. It's never dull moment. We have a good time in this room. And can you talk about self-expression in your classroom? So the students get a choice of how they want to express any project, um, however they want. Um, so when we finish like a book, they have any way of expressing how that book meant them to feel. Like I have a, over there I have a, I have a, the, they finished The Giver and I have a drawing that they did. One year students made videos of how they wanted to conclude that self-expression of that piece. So self-expression is just really helping the student like try on different hats to see how they can behave as an adult, um, as an adult in the future. So I really appreciate that in this room, it's really safe for them to try these different hats and see how they're going to fit in society. Just kind of this environment that you've created um, is such a, 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 a self builder for the children of the adolescent age. What comes next when they move into high school? Oh, so we uh, match up to the Common Core. We go actually beyond the Common Core um, with a lot of the stuff that we do. So we're preparing them to be as independent learners as they can. Some, um, some parents are feeling like um, maybe they keep homeschooling or maybe they go to a gifted school. Some parents are talking about that. Um, some people are going to ACC as a dual credit program. Um, but what I want them to do, I really, and I think the whole beauty about Montessori is that we're teaching a kid to learn, the students to learn. It's critical thought. It's them being motivated to enjoy what they're learning about and not, and it's okay to fail. Like, that's the thing about my projects that I love is they fail so hard so many times and struggle so much that they realize that, hey, when he says six weeks, we should start on week one right away <laughs> because it is not simple. None of these projects are simple that I throw at them. And I, I, I encourage the failure and just never that grit, that grit of just keep persisting. There is a, a comment here um, in the chat about um, what level of math do we go up to? And Charlie, maybe you can kind of address that a little bit um, since you're the end of our journey. Yeah. So um, that was really funny. Um, 
That's a great question because yesterday, one or two of my students found out that we actually were doing algebra two problems. Algebra two problems. Um, we hit geometry really hard. Obviously, with my 3D design and making, geometries hit really hard. So the level of math is, that's always a really hard answer because I, I start with the student at wherever they are. That's it. You, you, can't, you can't make something out of nothing. You just have to start where they are. So any student that comes in here, we just keep going and going and going until the, they want more and more and more. We just keep going. There's no reason to stop. No, up. Oh, that's calculus. Sorry, I can't do it. I mean, you're starting to divide up a, a circle the way you are. I mean, you're doing some calculus at some point. Like, why stop there? If they're really interested, just keep going. Yes, um, I think uh, just a, a final shout out while people are typing for um, all of the guides who participated today. You guys did a great job of capturing the spirit of your community because I know, you know, I've done these Montessori journeys many times before. Um, and, and I did have a, a worry about, we're not there in person. How are they going to know what it's really like? How are, but you guys did a fantastic job of really kind of showing what it is that makes, you know, Nova community or Live Oak or, or Lower L and the Juniper community, Children's House, Casita. We really saw the distinct characteristics of all those class communities. And I think we really did get a beautiful picture of the journey that the child goes through as they move through a Montessori education. So um, just some compliments in the chat about um, uh, the passion that you guys obviously have for your work, which is really wonderful. And um, just thank you for spending the time this, this uh, Saturday and going through this with us. So, and I guess we're gonna sign off now. So have a great rest of your day and um, weekend. And thank you so much for tuning in, everyone.